What's up, everybody? Welcome to Heresy Financial. My name is Joe Brown, and today we're discussing the crazy story about what's been going on with Hertz, the rental car company, recently. After they announced bankruptcy, they started trading within just a few weeks. They started trading at over 10 times their low. And so we're going to look at how that happened, why that's happening, and something that I am calling the Robin Hood effect. Let's dive in. Unless you pay no attention to financial news, in which case I'm not even sure how you found this video in the first place, you've probably seen articles or videos about what Hertz is going through right now. They're, you know, they filed for bankruptcy and their stock has been trading crazy. The first day of trading after they filed for bankruptcy, they closed somewhere around 50 cents per share. But within just a couple of weeks, they were trading at over $6 per share. Now, yes, their stock has been extremely volatile, so it's gone up and down. I've got their chart up behind me here so you can kind of look at it while we're talking. This low point right here is right around 50 cents, and this high point right here is right around $6. Today is June 16th, and they closed at a buck. 95. Now, it is not uncommon for stocks to trade erratically and go up and down and be extremely volatile following the announcement of a bankruptcy filing. In fact, lots of traders and hedge funds and algorithms, they look for crazy events like bankruptcies to happen so that they can start to trade them and take advantage of the extremely volatile swings. Because if you can time those swings right, you know, you can have moves of, you know, 50%, 100%, 500% percent in just a short amount of time and so lots of people will try and trade these not because of any intrinsic value not because they really want to hang on to the shares but just because they think this might be a, a good opportunity to make a quick buck in trading but the story of hertz is not as straightforward as it may look it's not strictly just a story of a simple bankruptcy filing and then a stock trading crazy following there's a little bit more going on here that is uh, really fascinating. And it all starts off with the bankruptcy filing of Hertz on May 22nd. Now on May 22nd, they were trading right around $3 a share. That was a Friday. So on the following Monday, the 26th, when they opened up for trading, they closed around 50 cents per share that day. Now there are two main reasons why Hertz filed for bankruptcy. The first reason is because they were just basically hemorrhaging cash, you know, especially from the coronavirus that, you know, their business had turned down a lot their you know customer base and their rentals they're just, they're not making any they're not making any money there's no revenue coming in the doors right now and the second reason is because of how extremely over leveraged they are it is just insane the amount of debt and not only the amount of debt they have but just the complicated nature of their debt structure right now and you can take a look at this uh this uh, chart here this flow chart to see exactly how complicated their debt situation uh, is and so the debt situation paired with the uh, fact that they're just hemorrhaging and bleeding cash you can see why they would file for bankruptcy now following the filing of the bankruptcy on uh, may 22nd they you know had to dot a couple i's cross a couple t's and essentially what happens after that you know a couple things get moved around the credit default swaps paid out and now the bondholders own the company. Now, in case you're unaware, this is what happens in a bankruptcy uh, proceeding. When a company goes bankrupt, the uh, kind of the order of operations, the first people who have any claim on anything left over in the business is the bondholders. It's the people who have lent money to Hertz. And so after the business is liquidated, broken up, and everything is kind of sold off, they're the first ones to get any claim on any of those dollars from everything shutting down and everything, everything being sold. So it all goes to the bondholders first. And then anything that's left over after all of the debt has been paid off and all the bondholders have been made whole, anything that's left over will then go to shareholders. People that own equity in the company will then, you know, get as much per share that'll be left over per share. And it'll uh, usually be paid out in cash to the uh, to the shareholders. This means that Hertz, as they're liquidating their assets, they would have to pay back all of their debt. Uh, you know, with anything that everything that they're selling off, they'd have to be able to pay back all that debt to make the bondholders whole. And uh, then any money that's left over, then that will go to the shareholders. And just to put that into perspective, there's 140 million shares of uh, stock outstanding for uh, for Hertz. And so there would need to be $140 million left over after all the bondholders have been paid out for the shares to be worth $1 
per share, and uh, then those shares would pay out that one dollar to every uh, every shareholder. That's that's just the typical process of how a bankruptcy proceeding goes. Now, specifically with Hertz, uh, as you might imagine, a lot of the debt is backed up. It's called asset backed debt. It's so it's backed up mainly by their main assets, which is their 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 fleet, their you know all of their cars, and so actively right now their fleet is being sold off it's being auctioned it's being liquidated all their cars are being sold and so every dollar that comes in from the liquidation of assets first goes to pay the asset backed debt all of the debt that was collateralized that's basically you know when you go out when you buy a mortgage or i'm sorry when you buy a home you have a mortgage that's asset backed debt if you don't pay the mortgage the bank takes the house that's the asset it's that's the it's the collateral that backs up that debt so same thing with Hertz some of their debt is asset backed and the collateral is not the house it's the cars and so as the cars are being sold off it's paying back that debt now there's other debt that they have as well that's not collateralized or not backed spe by specific assets but any liquidation of things like their property any properties that they own any intellectual property they may have Sometimes with companies, there's patents that are then sold off. And then any residual cash flow from any business that does come in, that all starts to go to pay off any of the uh, remaining debt that's not asset backed. That's not backed by any specific you know, collateral like the fleet. Now, once all of those bondholders are paid off then, anything that's left over that's then liquidated, that cash then starts spilling over to produce a value per share for the shareholders from whatever's left over. Now, as I mentioned before, it's important to remember that the reason they filed for bankruptcy is because they're hemorrhaging cash. They're not getting any new business, especially because of the coronavirus and the economy right now. There's very few people renting cars compared to normal and they have such a large expense base that they're just hemorrhaging cash from payroll and rent and insurance and you know everything else that goes into running their business they're bleeding cash really quickly here but after their stock started trading crazy like this it uh, it, it led them to have an idea they have an unused uh, registration on file with the SEC that uh, uh, that allows them to if they want to proceed with it to issue new shares now normal Normally when a company issues new shares, they do it to raise capital because they're going to, you know, use it to build a new factory or they're going to use that money to invest in their business in some way that's going to grow their business. And so if there's a hundred million shares outstanding and they issue 100 million sh new shares, that means that the, the value per share of every existing share that was there before goes down in half, right? Because there's double the amount of shares out there now. And they sold those shares. Those were new shares put into the market. And so the company gets that money directly. And then they can do something with that cash in order to, you know, grow their business. And so Hertz is taking a look at the trading right now and seeing, hey, there's enough volume right now, enough you know, traders coming in and buying and selling our stock and pushing it up to a high enough price. We have the ability right now, if we want to issue new shares and we could raise some money for the company that way. Okay, we need to pause here before we continue with the Hertz story to discuss order flow. Order flow, and this is something that I have talked about in past videos whenever I talk about companies like Robinhood or Webull or M1 Finance, any of these small, primarily online stock trading companies where you can open up an account with their app really easily. They don't charge commissions. They're pretty easy ways for the average person to get into trading. They're a little bit easier to use if you're just starting out than some of the uh, larger older discount brokerage firms like Schwab or E-Trade or TD Ameritrade or Fidelity. And they used to be a lot cheaper, but uh, now everybody uh, is commission free. Nobody charges commissions anymore. And so they don't really have any advantage anymore. That's something that I've talked about in other videos. But what, but what my point is here is how these companies make money because they don't have wealth management services like Fidelity and E-Trade and Schwab do. They just make their money from people trading on their platform. But wait, I thought they didn't charge commissions. How do they make money from people trading on their platform. Ah, that is where order flow comes in. When you place a trade, regardless of where you're trading, whether it's at TD Ameritrade or E-Trade or Robinhood or Merrill Lynch, when you place a trade, the broker goes to its market maker and sends your order to a market maker. Now, every stock out there has market makers on it. There's market makers that operate you know, on Apple, on Amazon, and every stock out there, their job is to make sure there's a market for those shares. 
And so when you go on and you see a price, you see, hey, this was the, you know, this is the current quote for a stock. That's not exactly accurate. There's a last trade, that's the price at which the last trade happened, but that's in the past. If you want a current quote, what you're really looking at is the bid and the ask. Now, there's going to be two different prices here. So if you, as a trader, if you want to sell your stock and you want to sell it now, you're going to sell it at the bid. That is the lower of the two between the bid and the ask. And then if you immediately, if you're the next person to turn around and buy that stock, you're going to buy that stock at the ask, which is the higher of those two prices. Now you're saying, wait, that's not fair. If you're buying and selling it immediately, why do you have to buy it at the higher price and sell it at the lower price? Well, because you're not the market maker. The market maker is the one that carries the spread on that stock. Think of it like your typical wholesaler or retailer for you know goods, you know groceries, products. You go to a store, they buy that product from the wholesaler at a lower price and then they sell it to you at a higher price. That's how you can think of the bid and the ask. It's the spread between which buyers and sellers, you have to buy it from the market maker and they are the ones, the market makers, get the difference. They're able to sell it at the higher price to you, buy it at the lower price from you because they're the ones taking on the risk of always making sure there is somebody willing to buy a stock at some price on the stocks that they're making the market in. That's their job. So as you can see, market makers will make their money from volume. If they have a really big spread between the bid and the ask, they're not gonna make very much money because nobody's gonna send orders to them. And companies like Schwab and E-Trade and Fidelity and TD Ameritrade and Interactive Brokers and Robinhood and Webull and M1 Finance, they have so many millions of trades happening every day that market makers are competing for their business. So market makers will go to Robinhood and they'll say, send me all of your orders and I make a nice spread between the buys and the sells. I'll give you half of that or I'll give you 75% of it or I'll give you 25% of it. They'll give Robinhood a kickback and they'll say, the more orders you send my way, the more money I'll send you from my profits by selling and buying between the bid and the ask between your clients. And so if you're a trader and uh, you trade with any frequency at all and you have more than just a couple thousand dollars, it behooves you to trade somewhere that publicly displays very, very clearly what their execution quality is and their order improvement because companies like Fidelity and TD Ameritrade and Schwab, they'll pass that order improvement back to you so that you get, they don't, they don't keep that themselves. They're not really making any profits from that. So they pass it through to you. So when you submit a market order, you'll, a lot of times you'll get a better price than what the quote shows because that's the market maker giving a break to Schwab or to Fidelity or to E-Trade. And then they pass that along to you. And so you make better on your trades because of it. And they can do this because they're making their money up for their company from a lot of other ways. So they don't need to make money from order flow. But companies like Robinhood and M1 Finance and Webull, they're making almost all of their money from selling orders. And so they pocket every single penny of the difference between the bid and the ask that the market maker kicks back to them. They don't pass any of that back along to you. That's how they make all their money. And so if you're a big trader, you trade a lot or you trade with more than a couple thousand dollars, every single trade that you do, you're getting screwed. Maybe even just, even if it's just one or two cents per share per trade, that can add up a lot over time. But wait, there's more. Not only do they just keep the difference between the bid and the ask that the market makers kick back to them, especially firms like Robinhood, they actually sell the data of your orders to high frequency traders. What this means is that computers and firms that run massive supercomputers to trade the markets extremely quickly and take advantage of fractions of cents moves up or down, they're getting the data about all of the trades that are happening on platforms like Robinhood, which means that a lot of times they can actually even front run these trades. Front running a trade means I know you're gonna put an order in to buy or sell something and so if you're gonna buy it, I'm gonna buy it right before you do, push the price up just a tad bit, and then when you go to buy it, then I can dump it at the higher price because you've come in as the next buyer. And so they're only doing this maybe a penny at a time, millions of times a day on all sorts of different stocks, 
you can see how this can add up really quickly. And because high frequency trading firms are getting all of this data from firms like Robinhood and Webull and M1 Finance, now you start to see the picture on how small traders are actually influencing moves in the market to a much higher degree than they could just trading by themselves because ultimately all the small traders money put together is a very small portion of all of the money that's being traded in the market. And so just the small traders altogether, they're not really pushing the stocks around by themselves. There's just not enough money that they're playing with altogether compared to the few players that are really big in the market. But when you consider that a lot of high frequency trading firms are getting their order flow before all the small traders start to trade, now you start to see how companies like Hertz after they're bankrupt start to blow up and become so volatile and stocks like Tesla become so volatile and stocks that just out of nowhere that are especially small dollar stocks because those are the ones that small traders that are trading without commissions that are looking for ways to you know buy a stock at a dollar fifty and sell it for three dollars they're looking for small little trades to double their money because they can't afford a full share of something like amazon now you start to see how small traders that are trading at places like Robinhood, Webull, m1 finance how they're actually influencing the market because there's a bunch of money in high frequency trading firms that are going out there and churning the markets ahead and behind all of the small traders. All right, now that we've covered order flow, let's back back out and relook at Hertz again. So Hertz is going crazy. We know that the amount of ownership in Hertz has been distributed to a much larger number of owners since they went bankrupt. You can look at this data to see, you know, is is the ownership, you know, spread out between a lot of different accounts, a lot of different people, or is it concentrated? Yes, there are a lot of brand new or small accounts that are trading this, which means that there's probably a lot of front running and high frequency trading happening on this stock as well because of it. But wait, there's more. Remember earlier in the video when I explained bankruptcy filings and how all of the money in a bankruptcy procedure Seating, it all goes to the bondholders first and then anything that's left over then it starts to go to shareholders this is where it starts to get ugly as we covered Hertz is hemorrhaging they're bleeding cash their debt is they're extremely over leveraged the the ability for them to raise enough cash to pay off all of the debt holders all of the bondholders and make all the bondholders whole is virtually zero they just simply do not have enough in assets to liquidate all the assets and pay back all of the debt holders in full. Not only that, there isn't gonna be any cash flow to rely on to pay the bondholders off after all of the assets are liquidated, number one, because they liquidated all the assets, but number two, even if they hadn't, their business is hemorrhaging right now. They're just not bringing in any revenue. And so when you take into account revenue is gonna to continue to fall drastically, their assets are not enough to cover all the debt. Well, now you start to see the picture. There's no money that's gonna be left over for the shareholders. There's not even gonna be enough to cover what the bondholders are owed. Now, the other thing that you need to remember is in a bankruptcy filing, once this starts to happen, the bondholders control the company. The shareholders are out. They don't control the company anymore. The bondholders are the one in control now. Now let's take a look at the share price of Hertz. The share price of Hertz after the bankruptcy topped out right about here at six bucks a share and it bottomed out down here at right around 50 cents a share. So if the company uses the full registration that they have the ability to do, they could issue around 250 million shares. That means maximum they could issue if the market absorbs it. If there's enough buying to drive the price up and absorb all the new shares, maximum they could raise about one and a half billion dollars from issuing the most number of shares that they possibly could. On the low end, it could be as low as $250 million or maybe even lower. Let's be generous. Let's say that everybody starts trading again and this thing just starts blowing up again and goes up to six bucks a share as they're issuing the new shares and uh, they're able to raise a billion or $1.5 billion for the company. That's not even enough to make the bondholders whole. In the best case scenario, if Hertz is able to issue their new shares and the market can absorb it, best case scenario, that still doesn't raise enough cash to fully pay off all of the debt. And all of the money coming in right now all goes to the debt first. 
And after all the bondholders are paid in full, after all that debt is paid off, anything left over then goes to the shareholders. But even with a billion dollars, that's still not enough. So the bondholders are the ones controlling the company right now. They're in full control. So they're looking at this situation. They're saying, there's enough trading to support us issuing new shares into the market. They even issued a statement when they filed and said that we're going to be issuing new shares. They even said publicly and plainly, we fully expect all of the shares to be completely worthless when this is done because there's not enough money to pay off the bondholders. Therefore, shares are zero. And so in practice, this means that every Robinhood trader, every Weeble trader, every M1 Finance trader, and obviously I know the people that are trading Hertz are not just trading there. It's just kind of the stereotypical place that the traders that are the small investors go to first when they open up a trading account. So all of the people trading this stock, including the high frequency traders and the, the, the large uh, firms that are doing some front running here, if they hold the shares, they are almost guaranteed to have zero left over in the end. Now, I would be shocked if anybody trading this thing actually plans on holding it and writing it out. I think there's enough information out there right now that pretty much everybody trading this thing is hoping to buy it for a dollar, flip it for a dollar fifty, and hoping that they can be the ones to sell out first at the top and don't get stuck holding the bag. I talk a lot about how wealth overall is not a zero sum game. There's winners and losers, but overall you can actually have real creation or real destruction of wealth. It's not a zero sum game, but in trading, trading is a zero sum game. When you win, the person that you bought or sold to loses. And so on net, all of the traders right now, everybody buying and selling and holding traders on net, when you aggregate them together, they're all, the only thing they're doing is transferring wealth from themselves to the bondholders. Now, yes, there will be some traders who buy it at a dollar and sell it out at dollar twenty, and they pocket a nice 20 cents per share. That's a real profit. They can lock it in. They can walk away. They were one of the lucky ones. They pulled money out of that system. But the more this thing trades and the more winners and losers there are, this thing is going to zero. So every time there's a trade, that's basically just a little bit of money that's going to the pockets of the bondholders. And yes, every trader that's trading this thing does think that they'll be the lucky one that gets to buy this thing at a lower price than they're able to sell it at, even though it's virtually guaranteed to hit zero. So the moral of the story is that even if you like trading just for the sake of trading and you really don't even care about whether you lose money or make money, you just love trading, at the very least, trade a company that has some chances that are a little bit better than a guarantee of zero. There are many stocks and casinos for that matter that have much better odds than Hertz right now. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit that like and subscribe button and share it with somebody that you think will enjoy it as well. Really does help at the channel. Really appreciate you guys. Have a great day.